So the reason that I, I'm, I'm, I'm reacting to Gary Orofsky's speech is because Gary Orofsky is a major influence in my animal rights activism and amazing, amazing major influence in the animal rights movement across the world and in the mainstream vegan movement. Gary broke into the mainstream quite heavily and he is, in my opinion, and in objective reality, one of the most amazing animal rights advocators who has ever to, ever existed the most i would say um and that's that's my opinion and i believe it's an objective fact as well gary is <sighs> no one has really got out there like gary got out there um i guess you know but not in the way that he did i suppose not in the way gary did it i mean you could argue that a lot of us have got a lot of media since gary but gary was definitely the vegan animal rights educator, you know, from the day. You know what I mean? No one, no, even to this day, you know, no one does it like Gary. You know what I'm saying? Guy is an absolute beast and a legend. And uh, just watching him, it's just like, man, watch and learn. Guy is an absolute legend. So... Uh, that's my Gary Orofsky speech, and I am incredibly sad that he's no longer that he's retired. And we should all, you know, try to reach out to Gary and say, "Come back, Gary! Come back, Gary!" and uh, get him to come back. So, anyways, uh, we're gonna chuck on his speech now, and uh, we're gonna, you know, watch it all together. So let's just share the. Uh... Here we go. It's is it that way? Oh, it's that way. <laughs> Here it is. I can reach out and grab it. Gary's the goat, the OV OG legend. So we're going to try to, I'm going to try to get to your, um, you know, if you have any donations, questions, things like that, we'll get to those after. In, in We'll do little intervals, I think, and uh, that's what we're going to do. So let's just chuck it on. Look at this. Look at this. Can we zoom in on that? Can we zoom in? On? No, we can't. We can't zoom in. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. 4.7 million views 10 years ago. Gary's speech, and he's also got a million on his own channel. But Gary's got millions of views all across uh, Facebook still, not just cranking. Got guys a living legend. So let's chuck it on. Tell me if you can hear it okay as well. Um, how come I can't hear it? That's not going to do well. Why can't I hear it? I can't hear it. Can you guys hear it? For some reason I can't hear it. Can you? Oh, oh I can't hear it. That's a problem. Oh, I know. Okay, so I don't need those. You guys can hear it okay? Good. So this is Gary. Look at him back in the days, doing direct action, getting arrested. Breaking laws from people from Jesus Christ to Nelson Mandela, from Rosa Parks to Martin Luther King, laws have always been broken to facilitate substantive change. Today's speaker holds a BA in journalism from Oakland University and a radio broadcasting degree from Spex Howard School of Broadcast Arts. Gary Yurofsky has already experienced more than many people will ever want to in a lifetime. He's been arrested more than 10 times wow. and spent 77 days at a maximum security detention center, oh, wow. all in the name of animal rights. Gary has lectured in hundreds of schools nationwide. Gary actually got arrested. He got six-month prison term for liberating over a thousand mink, uh, served 77 days in a uh, maximum security prison, which is pretty crazy. Five, including the University of Connecticut, Michigan State, and Bowling Green. Author Charlotte Montgomery even included a chapter about Gary in her book, Blood Relations. Please welcome national lecturer, Gary Yurofsky. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gary Yurofsky. Please take a moment and jot down my email address and my website in case you want to contact me later on. Today we're going to talk about the world's forgotten victims, animals, and the world's oldest 
and strongest addiction, meat. I'm going to challenge your belief systems today, so certain parts of the speech will be intense. But let me start with a quick disclaimer. I am not here to be your enemy. The views expressed today do not necessarily reflect the views of your professor or this institution. I am not trying to take you away from your religion. No religion mandates meat eating. It's interesting how he went straight into the religion hook. Uh, but like, <clears throat> he's done that. I think this was towards the end of his public speaking career. So he had already preemptively thought of, I'm not here to be your enemy, like, because people feel attacked. So he's trying to like knock so many ob like objections uh, from the start, just out of the park, just boom, get rid of that objection, get rid of that objection, because he knows the objections he's going to face because he's such an experienced uh, speaker. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Very calculated, Gary. The golden rule states, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Animals qualify as others. And thou shalt not kill. The four most important yet most ignored words in all religious teachings. There's not an asterisk next to that commandment saying, unless you walk on all fours, have fur, feathers, horns, feet, or gills. You can keep your friends, your politics, and your patriotism. Still watch your favorite TV shows and listen to your favorite music. So he's basically saying that it doesn't matter your religious persuasion, you know, polit political, where you sit on the political spectrum. This is a separate issue, talking about animal ethics. To be vegan, you can be yourself, basically. So he's not trying to, he's not actually involving anything else other than just, you know, he's talking about the vegan topic. So he's making sure people don't think that he's, you know, trying to take them away from any other sort of, you know, sort of ideology sort of people have, like, or religion, like Hindu and Muslim and Christian or conservative or liberal. Or He's just basically talking about animal ethics. So let's go. Even if it's Ted Nugent, I'll be making some sarcastic yet truthful comments throughout the speech. Please feel free to laugh while I'm being sarcastic. Just don't laugh during the serious parts. I'm going to speak for around 65, maybe 70 minutes, but then we'll do a Q&A session after for about a half an hour, so hold your questions until then. In the meantime, I have some rhetorical questions for you. Is This is Socratic method. Now, when I first started uh, doing my street outreach, well, street interviews, I would just ask people questions because I found it. Like, I, did a, I didn't know about Socratic method. Back then, there was no vegan street interviews doing animal ethics online. But I just found that it was such a non-intrusive sort of indirect way of getting people to sort of contradict themselves and undo, you know, their social, con their cultural conditioning and things like this. But Gary actually does it in his speech. Let's go. Slavery. So Only let's go back. Hour, so hold your questions until then. He asked the in audience the questions. I have some rhetorical questions for you. Is slavery, owner, victim, profit, domination, exclusive to the human race? Have blacks, Jews, women, and children been the only victims of this atrocity? Have not cows been enslaved? What about pigs, chickens, turkeys, fish, sheep? If they're not enslaved, then what are they? Free. That was best. I love that quote. Who loves that quote? Who's heard that quote? If they're not enslaved, what are they? Free? Logic, logic, logic. Non-human animals are slaves, and I'm sorry if that truth harms your little reality there, but animals, non-human animals can be enslaved just like human animals can. Can slavery have a victim that is neither human nor animal? This is where we're going to disagree. I don't think slavery can have a, have a victim that is neither human nor animal, animal but I, I think it's very poetic what he says next. Have not the oceans, the forest, the earth itself become victims of ownership too? 
And what about a slaughterhouse? House of slaughter. Slaughterhouse. Do you really think there's such a thing as humane slaughter? Exactly what is your definition of humane? Besides psychological and physical abuse, torture, dismemberment, and murder, what else do you think happens to animals inside of a slaughterhouse? You think they get belly rubs and tushy slaps? And if you think there's such a thing as humane slaughter, I'm curious, do you also think there's such a thing as humane rape, humane child molestation, humane slavery, how about a humane holocaust? In fact, what is your definition of a holocaust? I love how he nails that humane slaughter insanity to the wall. Like, if you think humane slaughter of animals exist, then you have to also believe that what these atrocities that happen to human beings could also be classed as humane. Like, humane, you know, mass genocides, trying not to make them suffer too much, but just wiping them out really quickly. You, you know, like, as soon as you put these insane arguments in the human context, you soon see how just ignorant and hypocritical human beings are when they deploy these arguments against another species. Because you like, if you think it's so humane, why don't you trade places with the animals? Why don't you have your family members trade places with the animals if it's so humane? Hmm? You wouldn't, would you? You know, living, you know, a fraction of your lifespan and going face, walk down, you know, the death aisle in a slaughterhouse. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. So let's go. Gary, the man. Is it a massacre of human beings? Or a How about a humane holocaust? In fact, what is your definition of a holocaust? Is it a massacre of human beings? Or a massacre of innocent beings? Animals, non-human animals can be victims of a holocaust as well. Okay, it wasn't just one race of people who have experienced a Holocaust. Many different races uh, of people have experienced a Holocaust. Okay, now non-human animals can also experience a Holocaust and they're experiencing it right now. I thought it was innocent, which brings us to the biggest Holocaust massacre of all. Every year in America, Without mercy, we murder 10 billion land animals and 18 billion marine animals. Just worldwide statistics, it's about uh, between 75 to 77 billion land animals, between 1 and 3 trillion, trillion marine animals, including uh, bycatch, whales, dolphins, sharks, porpoises, uh, turtles, insane amounts of suffering, a massive holocaust of non-human animals. Not for health, survival, sustenance, or self-defense. People eat meat, cheese, milk, and eggs for four reasons. Habit, tradition, convenience, taste. When you think about that, that's really pathetic, isn't it? And it makes it even more horrible. Like... If this were happening because there were some, you know, really difficult survival justification for it, and we were like, we will die off of as, as a species if we don't do this horrible thing and we are deeply, deeply sorry about it. No, nah, it's not that. There is no reason to do this other than, you know, what Gary stated, habit, taste, tradition, you know, these Stupid, pathetic, trivial reasons to commit the worst atrocity that has ever existed. And people still have these insane, pathetic justifications for something that is like out of a Stephen King novel. Like something like out of a Wes Craven movie is happening perpetually to innocent beings as we speak. Vegans like vegetarians do not consume the meat of any land or marine animal. 
Vegans, however, unlike vegetarians, also refrain from eating cheese, milk, eggs, honey, or any animal product whatsoever. We also don't wear animal skins, no fur, leather, wool, silk, or down. And I want to let y'all know that I was not raised vegan. I ate meat, cheese, milk, and eggs for around 25 years. And also, like, being a vegan is not just what you do, like Gary is saying. Um, you know, yes, these are the things vegans avoid doing. But veganism is a moral principle, a philosophy against the exploitation and cruelty to animals. You hold this philosophy, and by virtue of holding this moral principle, your actions follow that, okay, which is what Gary is saying here. He's got a. He's educating a class full of students and just explaining what we avoid. But the reason we avoid it is because we hold this moral principle. Okay. Five years. I used to wear leather shoes and belts and jackets like everyone else. In fact, around 20 years ago, I even owned a fur coat. Needless to say, I understand your lifestyle. It used to be mine. And for people involved in politics. So what are you saying? What he just did there, um, Gary, he said, I used to live this lifestyle. So he's basically building rapport with the audience. He's basically showing like, hey, like I was like you. I used to do this as well. And I woke up. So like what, what it does is it sort of brings you back down. Like he's not just saying he's not saying he's some um, morally superior person his entire life. But he's saying now he's realized and you should realize too. Like I've been where you've been. I think that's an excellent way to build rapport with someone. It bring every time I've done something similar to Gary, it's bring it brings down people people's guard. Like, look, I used to be a hypocrite too. I used to abuse animals as well. Okay, but I've changed. I even go one step further because I used to be in gangs, and I say I see you harm people too. You know, but I turn my life around, and now I'm a vegan, and I don't harm animals either. So, like, I think doing that really sort of brings the guard down a bit and gets them to go, oh, wow, okay, so you used to be like this too, so I don't have to be so defensive now. Owned a fur coat. Needless to say, I understand your lifestyle. It used to be mine. And for people involved in politics, let's get this out of the way right now. I am not a Democrat, an anarchist, or some hippie with a closet full of tie-dye shirts. I'm not a Republican a socialist or a fascist i'm an activist gary 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 human politics annoying waste of time just causes arguments and wars and i think he, the idea of him saying this is that uh politicians rarely change the world do they like it's usually activists it's usually usually activists who don't have vested interest but have an interest in justice, you know, look back in history, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, um, Nelson Mandela, you know, freedom fighters are activists, aren't they? They're not politicians. They're rarely politicians. And usually it's activists who get into politics as activists, <laughs> you know. Root word is active. I've been banned from five countries so far and arrested 13 times for random acts of kindness and compassion on behalf of my animal brothers and sisters. <laughs> arrested for random acts of kindness. <laughs> oh, my God. That, this is the insane world we're living now, in, though, isn't it? Like, where we activists are called extreme. Vegans are called extreme for boycotting the worst atrocity that has ever existed in the history of the world. Um, and <laughs> he Gary's getting arrested for random acts of kindness to animals. Arrested, put in prison with murderers and armed robbers and meth dealers because he freed mink from torture and slaughter. Do you want to live in that world? Do you want to live in that world? We'll help us change it. If you want to read up about that, check out my website. And today... I would love to give you a chance to actually do something and truly get involved. Because I understand a lot of people want to get involved. Honestly, I do. But putting a coexist bumper sticker on your car, wearing a What Would Jesus Do bracelet, or sporting a Peace and Love and Sunshine t-shirt, 
that is not getting involved. I understand that we're all on a journey in life. So basically, he's saying that, you know, something I usually say is the animals don't care what you say. That's just lip service. You know, people in wars overseas don't, it doesn't matter to them that you're against it morally, like just in your mind or you wear a T-shirt. What matters is if you is if you aren't causing it and you're actively trying to stop it, okay? And with the animal holocaust, you by being vegan, you 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 stop yourself from contributing to it. You know, that's actually taking, you know, you were taking a horrible action against the animals every day with your lifestyle. When you when you go vegan, you sort of take this neutral position. And that's all he's asking them to do. He's not even asking them to be activists. You know what I mean? He's not saying you better go out there and help us stop it like he's doing. He's just saying stop causing this horrific thing to them through your lifestyle. So it's a very interesting sort of persuasion here. <laughs> it's not like, hey, like, you know, we need you to do something here for the animals, go into a slaughterhouse, leave cameras in there, get arrested, uh, you know, do direct action, chain yourself to a moving truck full of animals and, you know, risk your life. It's no, um, I'm just asking you to be vegan, meaning stop purchasing products that cause their enslavement, murder, torture. It's a neutral position, veganism. It's just interesting. Like, you know, he's has to be having to persuade people from doing something horrific, you know. So anyways, it says, uh, oh, YouTube, it says, first time I donate online. I don't have much, but I believe in the powerful message you bring to this world, vegan five years this month. Thanks, Joey. Thank you, YouTuber. Appreciate it, mate. Thanks for the donations. All the AdSense from the channel goes into our operations and what we do here. Um, everyone can hear this okay before we continue? Joey, Joey is likely the most motivated person on earth. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. We'll go through peaks and valleys, don't we? But let's keep going. We all have different... I think dedicated is a better word to describe dragging yourself through activism. Sunshine t-shirt that is not getting involved. I understand that we're all on a journey in life. We all have different likes and dislikes, different nationalities and religions too. But there's one thing that we need to have in common with each other, and that's peace. Genuine compassion and genuine peace for our planetary companion. How extreme that Gary Yurofsky is asking for peace. What an extreme militant terrorist. You know, you know, he's you know, Gary is actually considered a terrorist. That's not even a joke. He is considered a terrorist. He can't travel to certain countries like Canada and I think UK and things like this because he freed those mink. He's considered an international terrorist for freeing mink, you know. And look at it. Listen to his speech. Oh, you know, one thing we should all have in common is peace. Wow. What? How extreme, Gary? What, you're asking for peace? Throw him in prison. You know, it's just insane. We're living in the twilight zone, aren't we? Let's keep going. Sorry, Gary, for interrupting. Contrary to political and religious dogma, animals do not belong to us. They are not commodities. They're not property and they're not inanimate, stupid objects who can't think and feel. Just so sad that he has to stand there, you know, talking to a bunch of college students and tell them that animals are not inanimate objects who can't think and feel, you know. They deserve better than to be chopped up for a sandwich. It's just insane, man. We're going to look back on in this in history and just be like, what? Like, what happened? How did how did we get here? Why were these activists persuading people away from doing this horrific thing? Like, from just using simple logic? Like, what happened to the to the population? You know what I mean? Like, ugh, it's crazy. That Descartes Cartesian way of looking at animals. Like their machines, it is outdated and quite frankly, 100% insane. Because if we all understand that animals can use their eyes to see, ears to hear, noses to smell, mouths to eat, legs to walk, feathers to fly, fins to swim, genitalia to procreate, bowels to defecate. I'm always perplexed that most people don't believe that they can also use their brains to think, feel, 
Be rational. Be aware. Be self-aware. Am I supposed to believe that every body part on an animal functions just like it's supposed to? Except the brain? <laughs> oh, Gary. This is too much logic. This is God creating Gary. Like, this is God creating a normal person. We'll just have just just we'll give him a little bit of logic. This is God creating Gary. This is God creating Gary. Oh whoops! Oh, oh dear! Oh, oh god! Oh, oh my god! Oh damn! What should we do? Like Jesus, what should I do with this one, Gary? Um, it seems we've overfilled the logic. Should we just put him out on the earth anyway? And Jesus is like, yeah, you know, just just put him out there anyway. There we go. Puts him out in the world. That was God creating Gary. Too much logic, Gary. Like, you know. <sighs> People that think animals can't reason or, you know, they they have no awareness of themselves or their suffering, like people do hold this position. And um, like how do you know that they're feeling that? How do you know that's not just an instinctual reaction I've heard, like them screaming to death in a gas chamber? How do you know that's just not an instinctive, you know, natural, you know, sort of like a reaction? Like, you know, like if you touch a leaf on a plant and it sort of curls, like, oh, my God. Anyways, let's keep going. Those lies are thick. The propaganda from the animal abusers is mm. enormous. I mean, when was the last time you turned on TV and saw a commercial for shiitake mushrooms? <laughs> People singing and dancing down the streets, having a good time, eating mushrooms. Well, actually, in Australia, there is a commercial about bananas, <laughs> and it's like banana, 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 and it's called Make Those Bodies Sing. You can see that. So there was something about bananas. So the banana industry must have had a bit of bucks there. But basically what he's saying is <laughs> meat, dairy, and eggs definitely have the monopoly on the food industry, like cheese, cheese, God, cheeses and everything. Che like you think like getting people on plant-based milks is the battle? The battle is cheese. You know, the number one people re vegans. The, the, the number one, the number one reason vegans. Uh, let me just say that again. The number one reason, the number one reason that vegetarians don't go vegan is cheese. Okay, and it's everywhere in everything. Oh, dairy, but yeah, he's right. They have billions of dollars. Like, just think, the the meat industry. Like, just think of this: the meat, cheese, milk industry. Right just those industries, their market is everyone. Like tobacco industry, there are, you know, adults or whatever. Some kids might get their holders on tobacco. You know, you know, certain industries can only target, you know, certain demographics of people. But meat, cheese, milk, and eggs targets everyone. Children, happy meals, and, you know, you know, baby formula, even babies. The dairy industry is even targeting babies, you know, to get them drinking, like, milk from another species. They have... They literally have the whole population eating their stuff, you know. So imagine how many different sort of sections of the dairy industry have vested interest in this and and, what, and don't want to see it fail. You know what I'm saying? Like crazy, dude. Like that's what makes me think. Like we're going up against monoliths, like monsters, huge. It's David versus Goliath. And here's Gary, Gary versus Goliath back in the days. About alfalfa sprouts, quinoa, it's a seed, radishes, raspberries, tofu. You don't see that stuff advertised on TV. What do you see instead? Have some more meat, have some more cheese, have some more cheese on your meat. Meat, cheese, double cheese, extra cheese, and how about a little more cheese with your meat? Have some more cow's milk, have some more eggs. And then what do you see interspersed between those advertisements? Not feeling so well? Need to see a cancer specialist? How about a heart doctor? Need some Lipitor? Zocor, Crestor, Plavix. Need some diet pills? How about some energy drinks? Some KO Pectate? Tums? Pepto-Bismol? You've been duped. They're killing you. They're killing the animals and they're killing this planet. And those blinders are on nice and tight. So the blinders, you know, they no awareness. People don't have the awareness, which is why we need activism so much, you know, to create the awareness. I don't care if people get angry with me. 
I want people to become aware. And if anger is a part of that awareness, so be it. Wakes you up. It wakes people up when they start, they get this backfire effect and they're like, oh, I can't believe you said that. And then they start thinking, don't they? They go home and they start thinking. So he's basically saying they're murdering all the animals and then they're selling you products that are murdering human beings. Because number one killer is heart disease, isn't it? Number one killer of human beings, 17 million people a year is heart disease and uh, saturated fat cholesterol build up in your arteries and kill people. So he's basically just saying like they're, he's, Get telling the audience basically that they are making bulk cash off of torturing and murdering animals and then feeding it to to human beings, you guys in the audience, and it ends up making you sick and fat and you know not well, and it destroys the environment as well. So he's really, you know, he's really hidden every sort of area here. But if you give me an open mind today, that's all I ask for, an open mind. I'm going to take your blinders right off. My goal is simple. All I want to do is reconnect people with animals. Awaken some emotions and some feelings and some logic that has been buried and suppressed intentionally by our society. And the reason why I say reconnect, it's because each and every person in this room used to be a real animal rights person at one time, a true animal lover, and a real friend of the animal kingdom. And it's when we were kids. When we were young, when we were kids. How true is that though? Like when you're a kid, like when I, I remember when I was a kid and I used to say this in my speeches, that I remember on Christmas morning, I didn't want to step on an ant because it was Christmas because I was like, oh no, I don't want to kill this little ant. I remember I was probably about four or five years old and I was like making sure my little brother didn't step on the ant, like a little ant, a tiny little ant. I was like, no, I don't want to kill him. It's Christmas time. We better not kill these ants. So like this is how kids think. They, they see things that adults don't think because – they see things adults don't see because adults are too busy. Like even now, me and adult, I'm just too busy thinking of everything else. And like, it's really hard to break out of that and just have awareness for the conscious beings around you and, you know, and what, what, what your actions are actually causing. So like a, a child is like a pure, pure human. They have their pure human nature. And what happens when we grow, grow, grow up, we get sort of culturally conditioned. And this is what we do and don't do. These are, these are the animals we eat and we don't eat. Uh, you know, this is bacon and ham and this isn't a pig. Uh, you know, you, you never get to make that connection. Uh, this is a fish finger. It's not a fish, you know, and, uh, the, you know, we don't hurt the dog or the kitty at home, but, we, you know, you can eat the pigs and the cows and the chickens and the fish and the beef and the pork and the cheese and, you know, cow's milk is for humans and all this stuff we learn along the way. But I'm sure you showed a kid the dairy industry and, like, you know, male calves having their head hammered in because they are just waste products and thrown in a bin. So I have to show kids the, the – um, the calf bin that I was at the dairy farm and there was two dead calves in there, you know, like just horrible suffering, you know, I'm sure that they would just easily just say, I don't want anything to do with this industry or they would probably cry and be traumatized from it. It's man. We used to be in all animals. They used to make us laugh and giggle and smile. They made us pretty happy. And there was a time in our lives when we would do just about anything in the world to make them happy as well, to protect them from cruelty, or to at least acknowledge the cruelty they were receiving. I mean, if somebody was mean to an animal in front of us when we were little, we would have screamed and cried. And that's because we all used to understand right from wrong when it came to the treatment of animals, until somebody told us and taught us differently. You better believe somebody told us to ignore their suffering, to mock and excuse their pain and their misery, to make fun of their very existence. And this is something I want you to focus on today, tomorrow, and beyond. What in the hell happened along the way? Who taught us to be so mean? How true is that? What happened along the way, eh? It's just so interesting that so many of these things that I've taken on board from Gary, but I just, you know, you don't, they, they hit you in the subconscious and then you go on to sort of repeat these things in your advocacy and you don't actually consciously do it. It's more like he woke us all up, a lot of people up and he hit you with all this logic and then it's up to you to grow off of that and sort of evolve off of that. And that's how leaving a legacy works. You know, you leave your legacy to a bunch of different advocates and people, they spin off of it and they go on their own way and they, all you have to do is wake someone up. And once you've woken someone up, they work out the rest. 
because it's like once the veil is lifted, you can sit there and logically think through all the other, you know, inconsistencies and, you know, you can come up with your own rhetoric and your own advocacy from it. But all you need to know is these core principles and, and like the best teachers don't teach you what to think. They teach you how to think, you know, and that is a, that is a skill that will help you through this maze, crazy maze of upside down land we call planet Earth. Um, so this is what Gary did. He taught us how to think, how to think about this issue. Think of it from the victim's point of view. Do you want to be the victim? So that's how you should navigate it. If you're ever stuck on an animal rights question, put yourself in the animal's position, get the person asking you the question, get the person asking you the question to put themselves in the animal's position and, you know, go from there. And nasty and vicious and hateful or indifferent towards animals when they used to be our friends. These are innocent beings who have done nothing wrong to us. Because I'm pretty sure we can all agree in at least one thing right now, that hatred in its purest form is a learned behavior. Racism, sexism, heterosexism, anti-Semitism, misogyny, these are all learned behaviors. When kids are two, three, four years old playing on a playground, they could care less about the color of their friend's skin or their religious background. I don't think there's any doubt that hatred in its purest form is learned. So species... In How true is that, though? Kids aren't, like, naturally racist, are they? They're taught that, you know? And it's usually by people older than them, caregivers, something in their, you know, day-to-day -day lives that teaches them that. But, like, children in their purest form aren't discriminatory. They'll play with anyone. You know what I mean? They don't see it like that. Like, I went to a full multicultural school. There was, it was uh, Aboriginals and uh, Cambodians and Vietnamese. And I was, like, one of the only pale-skinned – well, I'm Italian anyway, but I was only the only – one of the only Caucasian sort of kids – in my class, but I didn't see it like, like that. You don't see, like when you're young, you just don't see it like that. And I, that, like, so I didn't have this, this racist sort of um, ideology instilled into me. I was around kids of different nationalities all the time. But if you are born, if you are brought up around like white supremacists in the deep South or something like this, you could very easily see how these children could grow up with these discriminatory ideas and beliefs now he's going to go on to talk about the most deep-seated you know sort of underestimated and almost ignored um form of discrimination and that's speciesism ism is no different this could be a new word to a lot of people it's up here on the screen right below vegan the word species with an ism attached to it and I want to define this word as the unethical, unprincipled point of view that the human species has every right to exploit, enslave, and murder another species. Kind of like the, the supremacist mindset, isn't it? Like human beings choose who lives, who dies. Pigs die. Dogs don't kill them. Whales, save the whales, tuna, stab them in the head, cut them up into sashimi. You know, like supremacists decide. You know what I mean? And all because we believe that our species is so more special, so more superior than the other ones. We're the only ones that count, and we're the only ones that matter. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. But that line of thinking, that thought process, that is the basis of all forms of discrimination. Absolutely. This is where you find uh, principal fundamental truths that, you know, wake you up to things like discrimination and just species, speciesism, right? That form of discrimination yields more victims than any other form of discrimination that exists. Their speciesism is the most dangerous in terms of causing suffering uh, form of discrimination that has ever existed. There is, 
the number of victims in the wake of speciesism is incomparable to any other atrocity. It literally, every other atrocity is a blip on the radar of the moral universe compared to the wake of victims um, that speciesism has left behind. Just in four weeks alone, four weeks, a mere four weeks, speciesism is responsible for killing more non-human animals than the number of human beings that have ever existed in history. Okay, so we're talking about what, just over 100 billion humans have ever existed. Human beings kill more non-human animals than that in a mere four weeks. And the reason behind it is speciesism. So it's an incredibly dangerous form of discrimination. One group saying and thinking they're more special than everyone else and they proceed to exploit them oppress them, denying them their right to be free. They treat them like property. They enslave them in many cases. And in many other cases, they murder them with premeditation and without penalty. And understand something essential about discrimination. It is never okay to be picking and choosing which forms of discrimination to be opposed to. Which ones to say are evil, racism, and which ones to say are okay speciesism discrimination is evil on its foundation or it's not cannot have this one both ways it doesn't work like that otherwise you would be a complete hypocrite and the ones who you know the anti-racist anti-sexist pro-speciesists are the biggest hypocrites on earth they are just sickening like how can you be anti every other form of discrimination except speciesism like, would you like to include animals in your intersectionality, please? Otherwise, you just look like the biggest hypocrite on earth. I want to ask you to use some empathy right now. And when I say empathy, what I'm saying is, is place yourself in the position of the animals and start to view this issue from the animal's point of view, from the victim's point of view. When you examine any form of injustice, whether humans are victims or animals are victims, Please remember the victim's point of view. <laughs> uh, yeah, like we shouldn't be looking at it from the oppressor's point of view. Like, oh, I tried to eat lentils, but I had a sore tummy. I'm going to have to put a pig in a gas chamber now and cut their head off. Like, oh, like, you know, the thing is, like, the way I'm saying that sarcastically, it actually is very, it's, it's the saddest thing, right, that... Even a lot of the vegan community, like I'm not calling out vegans, this live stream isn't about calling out vegans, so don't worry. But I'm just saying like, not just meat eaters, but a lot of the vegan community, not not all of them, but a lot of them do, will, tr will let human feelings trump what happens to animals. Human feelings, literally. Like, oh, vegan was offend a vegan offended me. Or like, actually, you know, I don't actually like soya milk. Uh, you know, actually, I, I'll try doing meatless Mondays because I just don't feel like I can take the full step right now. Like people will be like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, eternal Holocaust happening behind the scenes. Like I could drive 40 minutes that way. There's a Holocaust con uh, concentration camp filled with animals suffering. Uh, slaughterhouse, probably an hour that way. You know, slaughterhouse, 20 minutes over there, actually. Chicken slaughterhouse. But human feelings are supposed to, supposed to trump this. Like, this is why you're saying, like, this is an important principle, fundamental truth you need to know. Always look at issues of injustice, especially ones that, of this magnitude, like, nothing comes close to this, the magnitude of this suffering. For, always look at these issues from the victim's point of view. <laughs> you know, you can look at it from all points of view, but don't forget the victims, which is... What tends to happen with the animal holocaust? People tend to forget the holocaust victims, you know, the, the non-human animals who are copping it left, right, and center. Let's continue. Uh, first, I'll say thanks, Reese. Pleased to be sharing my morning with two, two, our, two of the most important activists of our time. Thank you very much. Oh, that's an incredible compliment. Um, I appreciate that a lot, and Gary has inspired me a lot too. So let's keep going. If you are not the victim, don't examine it entirely from your point of view because when you're not the victim it becomes pretty easy to rationalize and excuse cruelty, injustice, inequality, slavery, and even murder. But when you're the victim, things look a lot differently from that end. 
Oh, that, that it's one of my favorite lines. Just when you're the victim, things look a lot different from that angle. Now, the reason that hits home so much for me is that I have been victimized myself. I was also a violent gang member, I'm not going to hold my hands up. I wasn't a good person. So I probably deserved a lot of things that come my way. But, you know, I wasn't conscious enough to understand karma and to understand really the impact of what I was doing back then. You know, I was young and I was on drugs, no excuses, but just the reasons I was doing things. Um, but I know exactly what it feels like to be targeted, ganged up on, held hostage, have guns pointed at me, you know, be in scenarios where I thought I was going to be killed. And it is the worst feeling of helplessness. Like, you don't know what to do. You almost, like, think, should I just kill myself to get out of this? Like, you know, it's incredibly scary. And a lot of people, like, they haven't been put in a position where they've been severely victimized like that, where their life is on the line. So they don't empathize with the animals who are literally in, like, a situation that you couldn't possibly imagine, imprisoned in a farrowing shed with, you know, just wounds all over your arms and you know your back just from sliding against the rails and dead piglets around you and there's like in in farrowing sheds there's just a grate at the bottom where their their shit and urine goes out down into um disgusting it smells to high hell in there it is horrible and uh you know just they go crazy the the sows go crazy in there. They're just biting against the cage. They're losing their minds and they can't even kill themselves. Like they can't, like in prison, you might get a chance to hang yourself. Like you might be able to get a, a sheet or something to end your suffering. But these, these pigs, they can't even end their own suffering. They're stuck until they go to the gas chamber. Well, they will, they will experience one of the most terrifying deaths imaginable. imaginable. So it's crazy. Let's keep going, Gary. Now I want to show a graphic four-minute video right now about what goes on inside of a slaughterhouse. I want to ask you not to turn away, not to close your eyes during this video. It's because if you choose to eat meat, cheese, milk, and eggs, I think at the very least you are obligated to see the pain and suffering you are causing. I love him. I love him. If you eat meat, cheese, milk, if you eat meat, cheese, milk, and eggs, I think you are obligated to see the pain and suffering you are causing. That not true? Is that not true? Tell me that's not true. Come on. If you eat meat, cheese, milk, and eggs, you are obligated to see the suffering and pain and violence you are causing which is why I show people the violence they are causing without their permission. I don't need their permission. They're the ones causing it. I mean, you know, they shouldn't be angry at me for showing them. They should be angry at themselves for causing it. What, you want to you wanna cause this mass atrocity to these innocent beings, but you don't have the spine to to face your victims? Sounds like cowardice to me. If you don't have the spine to face your victims, then be vegan. Simple. And once you're vegan, once you are a vegan, you've earned the right not to face the suffering of the victims, okay? I'll, I'll give you that. But I, I still do think that vegans need to remind themselves because too often I've seen vegans become complacent and become apologists, apologetic, and start to attack other activists saying you're trying to make us look bad and become inactive. Stop speaking about this. So, yes, um, I don't think we're going to... I don't think we're going to watch through the slaughter footage for this live stream. But if you do feel a need to turn away or close your eyes during this video, you might want to ask yourself a question. If it's not good enough for my eyes... And why is it good enough for my stomach? Classic Gary line. If it's not good enough for your eyes, why is it good enough for your stomach? God, that is a classic Gary line. 
what we're going to do is we're going to skip past the insane, horrible animal holocaust uh, because, uh, just for the interest of reacting to this speech, um, if you would like to see what goes on to animals, you can watch Dominion uh, on YouTube. You can watch From Farm to Fridge, or you could skip to the 16-minute mark of Gary's speech here and watch what he shows. Um, but, yeah, I highly recommend watching Dominion. If you, you know are eating animal products and you're watching this live stream or using animal products, you should watch Dominion and you should face your victims and you should decide whether or not you want to keep causing that to them. So. Give love one more chance. Oh, and look at this. The This is someone who is, sorry, I'm going to point this way. Is it that way? This is someone who's considered a terrorist. An, inter an international terrorist, and they won't even let them to the UK or Canada or, or anything like that. How crazy. This guy is considered an international terrorist. <laughs> Who's the real terrorist here? The producers of this film. The animals being slaughtered. They're the terrorists. Not Gary. <laughs> He's saying give love one more chance. But he's the extremist. We're the extremists. It's in crazy, dude. Like, surprise people just don't, like, activists just don't go completely insane, bonkers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do you ever wonder why McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's never show you those images in their TV ads? Instead, they show you smiling cartoon caricatures of animals singing and dancing and playing, lying to you, brainwashing you, programming you not to care about things you would normally care about. Just the way that he comes in off of this slaughter footage, he knows that it's heavy. So he knows, even though he's seen that slaughter footage probably a, a bunch of times, he knows how heavy it is to, to see that, to see that stuff. And anyone here knows it's heavy, especially when you first see it, and it's still heavy net for me now at times. But the way that he just comes in and they're lying to you and they've brainwashed you not to care about things you would usually care about. So he wants he wants the audience to be on his side together so they can both fight this atrocity together. He's trying to build rapport and get them on the side. He, he's trying to see the good in people. Do you know what I mean? Like he wants to see the good in people. He wants them to just join the, the side of the animals and to fight against the real, you know, evil out there. You know, stop paying them at least. <laughs> stop pay paying the the big animal ag to do this to animals because they're, they're doing it for you. Things that you <clears throat> used to care about. Right now, at this very moment, on American highways, there are no less than 5,000 concentration camp trucks. Trucks that we've constructed. Inside these trucks, there are living, terrified, innocent beings, cows and pigs and chickens. These trucks are being driven to concentration camp slaughterhouses that we've carefully constructed all across America. When the trucks arrive, the animals are so frightened, they won't even get off the truck. They're not stupid. They know what's next. So people go on the trucks with electric prods and force them to walk down the chutes to their own death. Or if the animals are small enough to manhandle like chickens, we'll just grab them off the trucks and toss them inside. Inside, these innocent living beings are hanged upside down, fully conscious. In other words, they go in alive against their will and come out chopped up into hundreds of pieces. Perfect amount of pause after he said that too when he... Just took that breath. Well, like, just that clip there alone, send that to someone, what we just watched. Powerful, powerful.
In other words, they go in alive and come back, come out chopped up to thousands of pieces. Crazy, eh? Crazy. Like, what do you think happens in a slaughterhouse? It's a mass production line to torture and kill animals. That's what it is. They're prodding them. They're forcing them to their death, these animals. They shouldn't exist. Slaughterhouses should not exist. <laughs> but they exist in huge numbers, and they're building more. They're building more every single week, you know, all over the world. Like, countries are building more slaughterhouses. No one even cares, you know. Human beings get killed in other countries and, you know, people get shot in the face and kids getting killed and that. You know, there might be a dozen getting killed, which is horrible. It's a horrible injustice, right? I don't support human beings being oppressed and killed. But trillions of animals are being executed right now. Like, it's like a million sentient beings a minute or something crazy. Five million, I think it's five, five million fish a minute alone. <laughs> You know, like, or marine animals. It's just crazy, dude. It is insane that, that this can happen and that no one cares. But I just, that, that, that part there was just incredibly poetic and no one really speaks for the animals like, it's such, such poetic um, power and depth. It's beautiful. Crazy ferret lady says, I said I loved animals but lied. Born in in 55, didn't wake up from my carnivorous coma before 2013 after watching Earthlings. The truth hit me hard. Still cry for the animals who died to feed me. Oh, dear. I know it's horrible thinking back um, when we used to eat animals. Sorry, I just flashed something up on the screen. Um, I went vegan in 2013 as well. Long time no see. This is a good video. Tell me vegan since seven years ago. Wow, amazing. John says... Thank, thank you for the donations, guys. We put them towards uh, the AdSense from the channel goes towards our operations here. So thank you very much. Let's keep rolling, Gary. Old mate Gary. We've got 300 people in here watching. That's great. Uh, good to see you all. Thanks for joining. Do you know what's more insane than that? Meat eaters walking around like their lifestyle isn't causing any harm. Like it's normal and natural be consuming violence and death. How would you feel if the day that you were born, somebody else had already planned the day of your execution? That's what it's like to be a cow, a pig, a chicken, or a turkey on this planet. I, th I think this type of behavior is inexcusable and unbecoming of a species that claims to understand right from wrong. Notice how Gary puts the crowd under pressure there. He puts them, you know, in the hot seat, so to speak. How would you feel if the day you were born, someone else had already planned, planned your execution? How would that make you feel? How would you feel walking into a slaughterhouse, being forced into a slaughterhouse to be executed? How would you feel? The animals have not done one single thing to us to deserve the wrath and the cruelty that we hurl on them. And I hope you all understand what I'm offering you today. When you hit the door after my speech, are you aware that for the first time ever, you can now directly participate in ending a massacre? instead of sitting around and paying lip service to all the massacres and all the problems that are always going on on this planet. What is so frustrating to me when I travel this country doing around 250 lectures every year to some 7,500 students is that everybody talks a good game. I've noticed that people are quite the smooth talkers when it comes to peace and compassion. I mean, people always want to tell me Never show me. Just tell me how peaceful they are because of what they believe in. This is what I talk about, that lip service thing. I mean, <laughs> the animals don't care what you say you believe. Like, oh, no, yeah, I don't care about animals. I care about their cruelty, but, uh, but they care about what you do. Like, 
I care about my wife, but I beat her every night with a large pole in the head and split her head open last night and probably split her head open again the next night. But I care about my wife, you know, but um, I viciously attack her every single night. She doesn't do the dishes or something like this. But I do love her. Like, could you imagine how insane that would sound? Like, you know, yeah, like just I love dogs, but I also... I love my dog, but I also, you know, engage in dog fighting with my dog till half their face is ripped off and they make me good money. You know, I love my horse, but I starve them and left them in a paddock. And, you know, this is like just lip service that means nothing, basically. It means nothing. And it all it always happens like when you ask someone, um, so do you eat meat? Or when you show them slaughter footage and they all automatically say, I don't eat that much meat. Like, I don't eat that much. But really, they eat at every meal, you know. So it's like, or like, no, nah, no, nah, I, I do care about animals, but I don't care about them enough to stop causing insane amounts of cruelty to them. So just never, I, I don't like even listening to what people say. You know what I mean? Because you can never, like, you can never really. I think even some people will just say that they're vegan just to avoid the conversation on the street. Really, you know? Yeah, I'm a vegan. Yeah, I'm a vegan. Oh, what makes me sad? Hey, Gary, I believe in God. And I believe in angels and I pray all the time. And those earthquakes, the one in Chile and Haiti, oh, that was so sad. No shit, it was sad. Since when does feeling sad about an obvious tragedy or believing in something make the world a better place or make somebody a good person? And listen, folks, I am not trying to dog you out when I talk like this. I'm not. I'm just not a politician. I'm not a bullshit artist. <laughs> he's not a politician. He's an activist. He's telling people the truth, isn't he? Telling people the truth. Don't people appreciate the truth? What would you rather, like, do you want me to lie to you? Do you want me to, you know, sort of uh, sugarcoat it for you so it doesn't hurt anymore? Or would you like me just to tell you the facts, you know? I don't need to be your friend to tell you the truth, although we can be friends, but I don't need you to tell you the truth about something. And sometimes it's your friend that will give you the hard to swallow truth, is it? Like, you know, sometimes your friend will say something to you where you're just like, God, I hate you, but that's so true. I've got to pull my head in and stop being like that. Or, you know, your friend might, you know, or your mum might say something to you that's like, Man, she just hit me with some truth there. I didn't like to hear it, but she's right, you know. And that's what truth truth speakers are just showing you respect because you deserve to hear the truth. They don't you don't need to hear some adulterated, buttered up, sugar coated, you know, rainbows and butterflies version of the truth because you know, most people that we're talking to are adults, okay? Children don't need that type of persuasion. It's usually adults that act like the big kids. Kids usually they don't want to harm animals, right? It's usually adults we're speaking to. So don't, so that, like, if I was going to show you respect, like, from one human to another, wouldn't I just tell you the truth? You know what I mean? That's the, that is, that is the biggest sign of showing someone respect is being truthful to them about this serious issue. I don't know how to schmooze people, as you can see. It's kind of beyond me. I hope you appreciate my honesty and my genuineness today. And I'm not a salesperson. I got no books to sell you after my lecture. No DVDs and no documentaries. No collection plate going around. I don't want your money. I don't want your email addresses. And I don't want your mailing addresses. Keep all that stuff. I am here to talk about the worst form of cruelty and violence taking place on this planet. Even though most people don't seem to care about it. Ain't that the truth, Gaza? Ain't that the truth? The worst form of cruelty taking place on this on this planet in the in unimaginable numbers, okay, inconceivable numbers to to human minds. It just is. You, you'd have to like to get the numbers up. You'd have to get these little dots and put it on this big screen so you could look back, and it'd be like grains of sand, you know, at the beach. I mean, I, I went, how many grains of sand would that be? You could probably fill up a beach with the amount of animals that are killed in a few years. You know what I mean? Imagine decades, hundreds of years. 
how many animals are being killed. I could probably fill up a few beaches of grains of sand just to try to count those numbers. It's insane to try to conceptualize the amount of suffering it causes. And like Gary just said, no one seems to care. But when you sit back in the comfort of your living room and you start condemning atrocities elsewhere, that is pure, unadulterated lip service. That's the definition of lip service. But veganism, this is now a chance to actually walk the compassionate talk that everybody's always talking about. This is your chance to show others how truly peaceful you are. This is a chance for a personal revolution to leave your mark on this planet by causing the least amount of harm possible. Always being vegan. Now come on, what's the argument for not causing the least amount of harm? Inconvenience? Indifference, apathy, selfishness. I want you to know, I don't live in fantasy land. I'm well aware that animals are suffering and dying just because we're here on the planet with them. We build homes through their habitat. We He's making sure that he addresses the argument um, that we are going to cause harm no matter what we do when living in civilization. You can't avoid that. Um, but you can practically avoid the animal holocaust, can't you? You know what I mean? So we don't need to cause this massive holocaust of animals on top of the harm that we're going to cause because of civilization. And I would actually call that, you know, justified harm because we have to live in civilization. It exists. And there are certain things about civilization that, like feeding the population plant foods, that are going to incur some type of harm. But when you talk about raising animals for food, the amount of plant food and land and, you know, deforestation and gratuitous amounts of suffering torture and murder that happened to animals uh on top of that um being vegan is by far the most practical ethical position that i can think of that is practical for the entire population um you might find some type of weird you know niche thing that might cause less harm than veganism but that can't be practically applied across the world um it's just yeah, to be vegan and to, create, and to have a vegan movement will be one of the best things to happen to the earth. And it's not where it ends, being vegan, it's where it begins. We pollute their environment, destroy their habitat. Is there a reason we have to maximize the suffering and maximize the cruelty and the death that they already endure? Exactly. By eating them on top of it all? You want to talk about pouring salt into somebody else's womb, 98%, and I repeat this stat, 98% of animals who are abused and killed on this planet are abused and killed by the meat, dairy, and egg industries. Oh, the vast amount of animal cruelty and killing happens in the meat, dairy, and egg industries. Doesn't take, it, it really doesn't take you know, Albert Einstein or Gary Rofsky to come to that conclusion. You don't actually need, you know, many stats either. You know, you just have to like think of the numbers, <laughs> look at reality and go, well, that's where most animal cruelty and killing is happening. It has to be. That, that Where else would, would human beings be causing this amount of suffering to animals? It just, there is no mechanism, there is no relationship with animals that we have that causes more suffering than let's just say the fishing industry alone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the fishing industry. How much suffering and killing does the fishing industry cause every year to send each of those sentient animals? Crazy. Let's go, Gary. This is where all the harm is taking place. And in America, from birth until death, each meteor consumes around three thousand land animals and thousands of other marine animals those are usda stats and i seem to think a lot of people eat animals because we've all been told that humans are carnivores we're omnivores we're meat eaters and we're supposed to be doing this he's got the best response for this i love this carnivore um omnivore response let's go are you aware that physiologically the human body is actually 100 percent herbivorous Plant eaters, 
the length of our intestines are somewhere between 7 to 13 times the length of our torso, our trunk. That's the same length of all herbivore animal intestines on this planet. They're very long. But the length of the intestines on real meat eaters, hyenas, coyotes, bears, tigers, and lions, only three to six times the length of their torso. They have a short intestinal tract, so they can push through quickly decaying and rotting animal flesh, animal protein, cholesterol, saturated fat, trans fatty acids, which is why it is impossible, I repeat, impossible, for any genuine meat eater to ever clog their arteries. Never happens to a real meat eater. What's the number one killer of humans who choose to eat meat, cheese, milk, and egg? Uh, Gary, I know this one. Gary, heart disease. Heart disease from clogged arteries, atherosclerosis. Humans and other herbivores, we sweat through our pores to cool ourselves. We don't pant like dogs and cats and lions that cool ourselves down. Some humans do, but yeah, we won't talk about them. Down. No claws on the human hand. Claws are a trademark of the carnivore and the omnivore. We have carbohydrate digestive enzymes in our saliva. Amylase. Only herbivores possess that, meaning we're supposed to be eating tons of carbohydrates like fruits and vegetables. Our teeth, broad, short, blunt. Sorry, Gary. What about that? I think Gary needs a little biology lesson here. Look at my canine. Look at the size of that. Gary. All right, let's keep going. Flat, just like the teeth of other herbivores. And before somebody blurts out, hey, Gary, what about these canines, dog? <laughs> Most of the herbivores have canines, incisors, and molars. It would not be possible for them for us to be eating hard fruit like apples without those teeth. Our lower jaw goes from side to side in a grinding, chewing motion like this. We grind and chew when we eat. It All right, everyone do it. Everyone doing, following along? Is that weird? Okay, let's keep going. You grind and chew. Oh, actually, wait a sec. We got DKK Roxa, Roxa Loops. We love you, Joey. Thank you for fighting for the animals. We went vegan four years ago after this, seeing this speech. Wow, amazing, Rod Sloops. Thanks for the donation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, let's keep rolling. When you eat like you all do, you are an herbivore. The jaws of carnivores and omnivores can only go up and down vertically. Rip and swallow. Rip and swallow. There's no chewing, grinding, side-to-side -side action. And I'm a fair guy. I mean, if somebody out there truly believes that humans are meat eaters, I'll give you two challenges to prove me wrong after class, and please do so if you want. I want you to go outside, <clears throat> locate a squirrel on campus. And when you spot that squirrel, put that carnivore speed into effect that everybody has and chase that squirrel down, pounce on him, and catch him in your mouth. No tools, no weapons, no cages. No one's allowed to be a cheater and a fake carnivore with this challenge. And when you are done killing the squirrel in your mouth, be my guest. Eat the squirrel. Eyes, nose, face, toes, tail, anus, inner organs, blood, fur, and don't forget about the brains. You don't get to pick and choose which body parts you want to eat, and you don't get to cook it either. <laughs> I wonder if anyone actually tried to chase down a squirrel. They have no chance in catching a little squirrel. And the squirrel would outsmart a human. They're so fast, quick, like little, they're like little acrobats. They will swing their little fluffy tail and they climb on everything. They're the best ever. But oh, Sverage, someone said Sverage. Yeah, I heard that guy, the raw meat guy. I don't think he could chase down a squirrel though. Like, um, you know, chase him down with his bare hands. We don't want to encourage that guy. I don't think he's okay mentally. So, but anyways, uh, <laughs> other than that, I don't think anyone really would have tried it. If people want to be real meat eaters, I'd love to see people eat raw flesh from the bone down to the bone with nothing left but the bones day after day after day. And challenge number two, find a two-year-old child. Place the child in a crib. In the crib, put two things, a live bunny rabbit, and an apple. If the child eats the bunny rabbit and plays with the apple, 
send me an email. Would you let me know? Because I'm going to come back and buy everyone in this room a brand new car if that happens. <laughs> Benzes and Beamers, leather interior too. In fact, next time I'm at Georgia Tech, if that well, basically, what he's highlighting there with that analogy uh, is that um, when you have a like a toddler, you know they have their instincts built into them, don't they? And if you had like you know, let's just say you know a young lion cub, I'm pretty sure if you put a bunny rabbit in with a young lion cub, that young young lion cub will just claw the the rabbit and probably start chewing on its head or something like this. But a baby herbivore would just start playing with the rabbit and wouldn't have those carnivorous instincts that we apparently evolved with. You know, we apparently evolved as, you know, meat eaters, but we didn't evolve like any other meat eater, like with these predatory instincts and we don't have these claws and teeth that if we evolved because of meat, right, because it was something special about, you know, meat eating. And it wasn't just the fact that meat was giving us calories and we could scavenge and, and things like this, even though like it's one of the most unreliable food sources like hunting, especially when you have crappy Stone Age weird weapons made out of rocks and stuff. You're going to come home hungry a lot. Yeah, like we have no biological adaptations to chasing down hunting animals, clawing them, you know. So for, for so many years, if we were doing that for so many like – Hundreds of thousands of years, wouldn't we have like a few adaptations to eating meat? Like something? I don't know. That happens. I will eat a steak sandwich in front of everybody, chase it down with a chili dog with extra cheese, a bucket of ice cream, and a bag of beef jerky too. <coughs> and I'll take the jerky and I'll dip it in the ice cream and eat it like that. Now I would not hold my breath on these promises, not that I won't fulfill them, I'm a man of my word. But those things cannot and will not be happening because humans also possess zero carnivorous instincts. So true. So true. I, the only people I've seen are like those wacky, wacky raw food eaters, raw, raw meat eaters. But they are like, they make the most of the population want to vomit when they're sitting there eating that crap. So like <clears throat> I would say that they're just outliers who are just, I don't know, forcing themselves to do something that's disgusting. But most people do not have carnivorous instincts. They want to cook, season, saute, sauce up, flavor their meat with plants, grind them up into a burger, eat it with plants. You know, this is most people. Zero omnivorous instincts when we're born young and growing up we're all born vegan we just acquire a taste for meat cheese milk and eggs after they're forced down our throats during childhood now all i'm asking you to do is something normal and natural anyways i mean you know what like for for lunch like i actually had two vegan burgers v2 burgers and they were very meaty and full of protein and a bunch of broccoli with hoisin sauce and it was incredibly delicious so like if you are like wanting that meaty burgery texture high protein sort of texture you can always just get a vegan burger so let's roll eat what comes from the earth every vitamin mineral and nutrient that exists protein calcium iron potassium all the B vitamins, you have an original source and it ain't the animals. You are aware that people eat animals after the animals have already eaten from the earth. People eat cows after the cows eat up the grass, some of the soil. Then we ship to a feedlot feed of most of our corn, wheat, oats, and soy. Then we take more of the corn, wheat, oats, and soy, shut down the throats of pigs and chickens and turkeys. Stop filtering your nutrients through somebody else's body. I actually did a post about this yesterday, if you go on my Instagram, and actually it's in my community tab for YouTube, where like someone's like biting into a pig saying, I need to eat meat for iron. And they're essentially getting the iron out of a slaughtered victim's blood. So they're like a terrified animal that was murdered in a slaughterhouse, probably suffered their entire life in a factory farm most of the time, pigs and chickens most of the time. They are getting their nutrients from the blood of a murdered animal. Sounds like it's kind of like vampirish, doesn't it? 
a very weird and sadistic thing to do. Like, oh, do you have any B12? I'm pretty sure I've got, you know, floating B12 in my body as well, in my blood as well. So, like, I don't think uh, – I would hope you wouldn't want to murder me to get the B12 out of my blood and just – maybe just take a supplement, you know, just a little tablet once a week or whatever, a little spray underneath your tongue instead of stabbing someone in the neck and eating their dismembered body for, like, nutrients that you can find elsewhere. It's illogical and irrational. Go to those sources directly. Fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, grains, legumes. These things cannot harm you, cannot cause a disease, and more importantly, they harm no one else in the process. But when we consume what walks, what flies, and what swims, that is abnormal. Where does everybody think diseases come from? Broccoli? Asparagus, kale, collard greens, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, peaches, nectarines, grapes, bananas, avocados, onions, tomatoes, cucumbers, spinach. And in case anyone's wondering about those pesky little E. coli salmonella contaminations a couple times a year with the vegetables, let's keep in mind the one and only source of E. coli and salmonella, shit. Human shit or animal shit. Spinach doesn't shit. <laughs> Broccoli doesn't shit. Peanuts don't shit. Let's stop blaming the plant products when there's an E. coli salmonella contamination. That's the fault of a meat-eating society. Why? Well, meat-eaters want billions of land animals to eat, so we have to mass-produce billions of land animals. Keep in mind, this has nothing to do with God, nothing to do with evolution anymore. This is a business. This is Smithfield, ConAgra, Purdue, Tyson, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, KFC. That's why we have animal agriculture classes in college. So when we mass produce billions of land animals, they have trillions of tons of manure. That stuff gets in the waterways, then there's runoff onto the crops, or they're putting feces contaminated water directly onto the crops. But all of our main diseases, heart diseases, heart attacks and strokes, most of the cancers, prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, kidney disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, high blood pressure, obesity, asthma, four main factors that cause them. Now, I know about other factors. I'm not saying that you can't get sick elsewhere. Of course you can. Smoking, drinking, stress, <coughs> chemicals in the environment, high fructose corn syrup, Twinkies. I know about the other things that can lead to an ailment, but the four main factors are found inside of meat, cheese, milk, and eggs. Cholesterol, saturated fat, trans fatty acids, animal protein. And I repeat that last one that nobody wants to hear about, animal protein. But when you go vegan, did you know that you eliminate cholesterol entirely from your diet? You can only get cholesterol from meat, cheese, milk, and eggs. And your body makes cholesterol on its own. That's the only such thing as good cholesterol. If you bring it in from an outside source, it's automatically bad cholesterol. You can take out around 95%. That's weird though, eh? Like, isn't that bizarre? Like, we evolved to eat meat, but when we ingest dietary cholesterol, it clogs our arteries. Like, forgive me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but... <laughs> Shouldn't we have evolved a mechanism to avoid, evolve heart, uh, to avoid heart disease by now? Shouldn't we have developed a mechanism to avoid heart disease from ingesting dietary cholesterol by now? You know, like, what? How the hell is cholesterol that is only found in animals and animal products dangerous to humans? You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. Doesn't that, like, doesn't that blow your mind? You know what I mean? Anyways, uh, steering towards we are looking like, you know, like, uh, it just, it just makes me wonder, like, were we herbivores all along and just, you know, ate meat here and there, like, to survive and that, and then it just turned into this big, like, calorie hit that we just become addicted to and um you know like i think were we just meant to be herbivores and then like survival situations made us eat meat and 
things like this. I just don't know. But let's keep rolling. Percent of saturated fat when you go vegan, and you can take out all the naturally occurring trans fatty acids too. Keep this in mind: between two to nine percent of all meat and all dairy naturally comprised of trans fatty acids. And you can obviously take out all of animal protein. Now, animal protein is way too acidic for the human body. We don't process it properly. It is the main reason why one in three meat eaters continually get cancer. And it's one of the main causes of osteoporosis. Were you aware that when animal protein enters the human body, it makes our blood acidic instantaneously? But our blood can't stay acidic for long or else we die. So our body has to figure out instantly how to neutralize the acidity. Have some good news and some bad news. Let's start with the good. Our bodies have figured out how to neutralize. Got some good news. Got some bad news. Let's start with the good news. <laughs> neutralize the acidity. Bad news. There's only one way to make it happen at this point. With phosphate. There's only one source of phosphate in the human body, bones. Just so you know, our bones are comprised of two things, calcium phosphate, and they're binded together. So our body leaches calcium phosphate out of the bones, takes the phosphate to neutralize the acidity, and then we pee out the calcium. This is why every single epidemiological study, those are the ones done on human populations, every single one shows that societies that consume the most amount of animal protein have the worst rates of osteoporosis, bone fractures, and cancers. While societies that consume little to no animal protein, the vegan and vegetarian ones, Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Rastafarians, Seventh-day Adventists, have little to no rates of osteoporosis, bone fractures, and cancers. And so we don't get into a debate during Q&A about different medical studies that are out there. A lot of times when people know I'm coming to class in advance, well, they'll spend a few hours online looking up studies, print it out, wait for Q&A, and go, hey, Yorofsky, I got a study here that contradicted everything you told us today. What's up with that? Well, here's what's up with that. You don't need a medical study to show you what people are dying of. But for the record, every study you can produce showing that humans need meat, cheese, milk, and eggs, I'll produce two. Two to one ratio, showing that meat, cheese, milk, and eggs are responsible for every major disease. But we all know medical studies can be manipulated either way. So even though I got a heavy two to one edge on this, I say toss them all out because you don't need them. All you have to do is pay attention to this meat, cheese, milk, egg eating society that we all live in. So how many of your family members and your friends' family members have a disease already or have died already from a disease? Because I can't be... Yeah, well, uh, everyone has someone who's dying from some type of disease, which is incredibly sad. I know the truth. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to go to Gary's page here. <laughs> what do we hit? What do we hit? Let's hit something here. Oh, the excuses speech. That's pretty good, eh? Hmm. The animal abuser reporter one? Let's go to his uh, most popular. Okay. Okay, let's go here. Blacks and cat Slaughterhouses, they sermon. This man said... That we have treated. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. That's good. saying, What are you doing to me now? Where are you taking me now? Why are you stealing, devil? Just leave me alone. And here I am going, Wait, no, I, I'm going to help. I'm just showing people what's going on. And they didn't recognize me. And this is where my anger emanates from when people don't want to listen to the message. This is why vegans get so militant because I don't want to be a two legged devil to the animals or to anybody. I don't want to be vicious and mean and callous and vile, but as a species, we are so callous towards the animals. That's how they view us. And it brings to mind. Yeah, animals are extremely, like when you, 
walk into, say, a factory farm filled with pigs, they're incredibly just broken and just must look at us like we are the evil slave owners, you know, like what are we going to do to them next? Horrible. Quote that made me go vegan way back in the day from a bishop from England, uh, William Ralph Inge, I-N-G-E, in an 18th century sermon, this man said that we have treated our cousins in fur and feathers so horribly that beyond a doubt, if they ever formed an organized religion, the devil would be depicted in human form. Wow. Powerful. That's a powerful quote, isn't it? You guys like that quote? If the animals ever formed an organized religion, the devil would be depicted in human form. The devil, the most evil, like, biblical evil. The devil embodies everything that is evil. Torture, violence, war. Like, you know, those who are into religion will always blame the devil. And I think the devil was true in Christianity, Catholicism. Uh, is Catholicism even a word? Catholics, Christians, Muslims. Do the Hindus have a devil? We are the devil to the animals. How how, how guilty. Like, we are the same. Sp well, ne like, this is why Gary just feels like awful being a human being. You know what I mean? After what our species, our race, are doing to the non-human animals. Like I could I can understand why Gary feels so ashamed to be a human being. You know? Cause look what we do. As a species, we're a terrible species. And um I understand why he hates the human race. Catholicism. Thank you very much, Rob Rob. Yeah, like I, I do get it. Like why he hates the human race because he sees all these horrible things. Now, you have to you do have to be careful not to just look at the bad, like with the human race. There's a lot of good that people do, but there's just this dichotomy. It's just like this double it's like, it's like people that are doing good things are also doing bad bad things, like they just don't know they're doing them. It's just it's horrible. But anyways, I get it. I get it. Let's go. That broke my heart the day I read it, and it still breaks my heart today because, again, they must look at us like we are devils. We cut things off their bodies, their horns, while they're fully conscious, off the cows. We cut the beaks off of hens. We rip the testicles out of baby pigs when they're born. We torment them, put them on concentration camp trucks. We send them to slaughterhouses. They know what's going on. They're aware. They're conscious. They smell death and fear and blood in the air. We cut them up into pieces. This, uh, this, this stuff has to stop. Over and over again, once and again, uh, you um, go to uh, ways of, of, of describing that we are used to, you, to, to, to hear concerning the Holocaust. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, pretty sensitive around here, but you, you stand for it. Yeah. Uh, isn't it over the top? to uh, to uh, use the Holocaust? The animal Holocaust was happening long before the Jewish Holocaust, during the Jewish Holocaust, and it's still happening today. I find it over the top that the Jewish Holocaust is compared to the animal Holocaust, because when you compare numbers, we're talking about six million Jews, and if you add up the other six million gypsies and blacks and Catholics and mentally retarded people, we're talking 12 million people were killed by the Nazis. In one year alone on this planet, 60 billion land animals, 90 billion marine animals are tortured, tormented, and killed in the world's most massive Holocaust. That's just in one year alone. In America today, 30 million land animals will be tortured and killed. Today, in one day? One day alone. Okay. That is a massive Holocaust. And... Jews don't own the term Holocaust. I know Jewish people of like course, to think it's course. our term, like black people like yeah, to think that they own slavery. And I have to, say, I have to admit that the numbers are more than impressive. But uh, the moral argument... Um, like I said before, like we kill as a race more non-human animals in four weeks than human beings have ever existed on Earth. So don't you dare try to tell me that this Holocaust of animals is in any way comparable to any human atrocity. It's just not, it's just, it is 
it is stands on its own as the the biggest worst atrocity that has ever taken place nothing comes even nothing even holds a, a candle to it like the candles like down here the animal holocaust is just this is year after year after year after year in every four weeks we're killing more humans than have ever ever existed it's crazy numbers one to three trillion marine animals are his gary's very uh conservative with his estimate on animals being killed there and it's over 60 billion land animals now we're talking 75 77 now like we're getting into crazy crazy numbers and it's happened perpetually every year and the population is increasing every year as well is is quite uh, uh difficult because uh, one of my colleagues here asked you were you to uh, to decide uh, Ilana Dayan asked you that mm -hmm. and I listened to your um, answer and I want to go back there mm -hmm. she asked you if you had a three years old baby and a three years old puppy that you have to save one of them would you choose I think it's a horrible question to be asking somebody and then I asked her back would she save a black baby or a white baby would you save a Palestinian suicide bomber or would you save a flea Nope. Because we act like human life is valuable, and it's not, especially when you talk about mass murderers and rapists and Hitler and Himmler and Stalin and Idi Amin and Slobodan Milosevic and Muammar Gaddafi. I mean, is anybody going to save Muammar Gaddafi's life? How come people didn't come to his rescue when they pulled him out of a sewer and took a knife and shoved it in his anus? Nobody cares about Gaddafi, Osama bin Laden. This is so false. We are all speciesist. We think that animal life isn't valuable. And we falsely believe that human life is valuable. If I can further explain yes, how, how, how unvaluable mm -hmm. human life true. You know, Gary actually likes to bring humans back down to earth because he is trying to attack speciesism. He's trying to attack human supremacy. So human beings, we inherently believe we are so special, right? And this is, you know, what is driving this horrible atrocity happening to animals because human beings just believe we are so special that if we want a sandwich, we can basically gas chamber a pig for it, you know? So he tries to break us back down, bring us back down to earth and kill that massive human ego and say, hey, well, we're not actually that special. And that's the idea behind this. I believe I'm speaking for Gary on Gary's behalf, but that's what I try to analyze here when he's bringing humans back down to earth by just saying we're not more valuable than ants to the ecosystem basically truly is do you know that if you took humans off this planet the extinction of humans would benefit everything that exists the animals the forest the air the water the mountains we are completely not special to this planet if you removed ants this is how special ants are. The whole ecosystem would collapse without ants. And I know you've been following the news with bees. If the bees disappear, everything falls apart. This is how special and valuable bees are to the world. Where do we get off saying that we are valuable when all we do is destroy and torment and think that we're superior and we dominate others? And this is why you wished, you said you wish that people... He's going to do a journalist thing here where he's going to bring up something Gary said a decade ago. And uh, this is what journalists do when you go onto the TV. They will bring up things that you've said, sentences that you've said, uh, the most extreme things that you've said ever. And this is what's about to happen. The twerk in slaughterhouses and get slaughtered themselves or something very bad sure. happens to them. I Listen, I wish evil on evil people all the time. And any sane per person would do the same thing. Was anybody upset when the Nazi hunters went and tracked down so Adolf Eichmann and brought him back here and so killed people him? people that work in the party in the streets <laughs> are like Nazis. Sure. To, the, to, to their victims, they are. Really doesn't matter to what you, I think. To you. To me, yes. But most importantly, to the victims. <laughs> so it's basically like, so the, uh, the slaughterhouse workers in the slaughterhouses are like Nazis and is what, well, to the animals they are. Well, let's just analyze that for this for a second here. Well, Nazis, they rounded up uh, Jewish people into concentration camps and 
led them into gas chambers and killed them and tortured them and they would rape them and beat them, you know, enslaved them, you know, horrible things, you know. And what do, you know, slaughterhouse workers do to animals? Whether or not it's their job, and I understand that, it's their job, but to the animals, they don't know it's their job and that they're in this world where people want animal products and they're actually doing it to supply people with animal products. But, you know, they're, they're being beaten and prodded, electrically prodded into horrible chambers and lowered down into gas or they're being put in a knockbox and, you know, being shot in the skull and then hung up by their hoof, sometimes fully conscious that sometimes the knockbox, the, the bolt doesn't kill them, you know, or they're being, you know, hung up by their little, uh, you know, the chickens and the turkeys being hung upside down and dragged through an electrical bath or put into a gas chamber themselves, you know, to the animals. Yeah. Like I can fully understand that. Like, you know, just replace the animals in the slaughterhouse with human beings and you tell me how you would feel. Would you feel oppressed? Would you feel like you were part of a Holocaust? I think you would. The victims don't see the people that kill Jews any different than the people who kill cows. And people that wear uh, furs should be raped. I wish, listen, I certainly don't wish that they hit the lottery. I don't wish that bags of money fall from the sky and boxes of lollipops land in their laps. You know, the weird thing about this is like, yeah, Gary said some pretty, you know, some things I probably wouldn't say these days and, you know, but like, like every activist, you're going to pick something about them, you know, like, but isn't it interesting though, how if Gary wishes bad on someone who wears the tortured skin of, you know, animals, you know, the animals that he was saving, like mink, he rescued the mink and liberated the mink. And then he was like, you know, if you buy fur, you're evil for supporting the, the fur industry. It's a, it's a murderous industry. They annually electrocute the animals. They, you know, which is they rape the animals. They, they electrocute them through their anus, which is sodomizing an animal to kill them, which is probably one of the most disgusting, cruel things that happens. I mean, a lot of cruel things happen. So sometimes they get skinned alive. So he's, he's basically said something bad about people who wear fur, okay, which, you know, people say things in anger. You've got every right to say something bad. <laughs> like when a child gets raped and killed, what do the public say about what should happen to the person who did it? <laughs> what would the parents want to happen to that guy? Would you be at, like, oh, God, no, you, let, like, you can't ask for that, you know, child murderer to be raped and killed in prison. You know, you can't ask for that. That's really bad that you said that. You're an extremist. I can't believe you want a child rapist and murderer to have the same thing he did to that child happen to him. You know, you can't say that, man. Like, that's, you, you're, you oh, my God, cancel this person. Can't No one says that. But when it's the animals, you see, when uh, someone like Gary wishes bad on an animal abuser or someone who's paying for horrible animal abuse, and there's enough information on fur now to, for people to know, you know, when he wishes bad on them, like he didn't actually go and do it. <laughs> he was just having like one of those fantasies that you're like when, when someone abuses a child and you're like, oh, I'd love to smash him or whatever. You know, that's all he did or whatever. Maybe he was more poetic about it and maybe he written an art in an essay or whatever. But people do this all the time when, when someone abuses a dog. <laughs> You know, like this is a point that I always make is like when I see dog abuse videos, you know, where someone is harming a cat or dog and you just look in the comment section, look in the comment section at all the extremists who are going, oh, they, they deserve what happened to that dog to happen to them. They deserve what they did to that cat to happen to them. Oh, if I got my hands on them, I would torture them for four days and then kill them. You know, like everyone says stuff when there is something that upsets them to do with cruelty and, you know, but when, when it's the species of animal no one cares about, all of a sudden the person who is wishing this karma on someone is the extremist. Well, you know, whatever. I wish evil things happen to evil people, but I want to be clear about this. Yes. I hope rapists get raped. I hope child molesters get raped. I hope all the evil people in the world have evil done upon them so maybe they can, for the first time in their lives, understand what it means to be treated like nothing. I don't understand why my wishes are worse than people's actions. Mm. People that eat meat, dairy, and eggs, people that wear fur coats, that support vivisection, that do vivisection, I tell you are why the most violent I tell you people why it's on the important. planet. I tell you
are the most violent people on the planet. Well, they're paying for the worst violence on earth, you know. Why well, it's important because maybe someone hears you right now and will take action which will be which will be violent, which will be a murder, a killing. Well, you know, like there's horrible violent movies and rap music telling people to kill people all the time and that doesn't I mean, I think they're they're problematic. But like Gary can have his opinion about what he some type of karmic fantasy he's having on evil people. Like what, what like people do it all the time. But you're just singling out Gary because he's an animal rights activist, you know what I mean? Single out the extremist animal rights activist who's holding us accountable, but don't single out everyone else who who says, oh, they hope that, you know, child molesters get shot, killed, raped in prison. You know what I mean? People do this all the time. It's a norm. It's actually quite like normal <laughs> for, you know, people to have an emotional response and wish karma on people who do horrible things. Okay, two things. Do you know when I made that statement? 1997. 97 i think that was like this was like 10 years later see what i mean they whip up stuff from ages ago okay it's been 16 years and not one person has raped a woman in a fur coat because i wished it all right okay so let's not get into people taking my words okay. that literally it was my wish it was my fantasy and by the way i also wrote three other lines about how rapists should be used in experiments how rapists should be tortured and killed how come people don't talk about those things that I say? Yeah. Nobody disagrees. You know, the hilarious thing is, is they'll be like, oh my God, I can't believe he said rapists should be used in experiments. That's, that's horrible. He's horrible. He, oh my God, he's horrible. But then they'll just go and pay for animals to be experimented on with cosmetics. And then they'll go to a circus to watch animals perform. And they'll go to the sea world to watch animals performing, you know, the suicidal dolphins in there just performing their whole lives and never get to experience nature and, you know, or they'll go pay for pigs to be gas chambered and they'll go pay for, you know, male chicks to be macerated in the egg industries and just horrible amounts of suffering. But they will have this problem with Gary's words to the point where they'll just like have a meltdown with words when your actions are way more violent, have way more horrible consequences than someone's words is in my position on violence they just only disagree with who i propose to be violent for see everybody thinks it's okay to kill nazis on behalf of jews okay to kill a white slave owner on behalf of a black slave but nobody thinks it's okay to kill a chicken murderer on behalf of a chicken so that's the issue at hand is why do we devalue the life of a chicken and why do we value human life so Maybe much because nature is full of species killing other species it's also full of species not killing other species 75 percent of the animals on this planet are herbivores <laughs> dropped a bomb on him then didn't he with <laughs> nature is filled with species who kill other species well nature is also filled with species of animals who don't kill other species and the majority of nature you know the majority of animals are actually herbivores so why don't we just you know try that of course. But why do we try to justify human behavior based on lion behavior or shark behavior? It's also unfair because nobody else wants to do anything else that lions do. You notice that convenient argument? We just want to do what the lions do when they eat antelope. No, the, the argument is it might be quite natural to kill animals. It's quite natural to lick your bum clean like a lion. And look, look at me there. I can lick, lift my leg right up and here I am licking my own ass. Like, this is completely natural. Like, what's the problem? I've just gone to the toilet. I have no toilet paper. I'm going to do what a lion does. Uh, you know, like, I might as well go hunt down the local neighbor's cat too, like a lion does as well. Uh, you know, this is just natural. Uh, you know what else is natural? I don't know. Ripping someone to shreds like a shark. I might just go down and, you know, I can't be bothered paying for anything at the store. I might just go eat the store owner like a shark would. I mean, this is nature. They eat seals all the time. You know, what's the problem? Killer whales eating seals. I might just eat that, you know, person I didn't like at the bus stop. Maybe you should do it in the most humane way possible. I'm going to murder him at the bus stop very humanely. I'm going to come up behind them with a hammer. And hit them really hard in the head and i'm sure that'll knock him out the first time if i don't knock him out the first time i'm sure i'll knock him out the second time and break through their skull and then i'll just eat their brain because i need protein and cholesterol and brains full of fat and oh yes i can't wait you know so humane uh, humane slaughter 
people and like uh, not exaggerate. Holocaust? What? Like a humane holocaust? See, I don't we know. can't throw this word humane out there when we're talking about rape, torture, and murder. You can't put the word humane next to exactly. it. Exactly. Doesn't work like that. That's not how the world works. Like if let's not like just automatically put the word humane in front of anything atrocious that happens, like, oh well, you know, there's a humane you know, I don't even want to say it because it's just <laughs> I can't even say it. Like there are some horrible disgusting acts of violence and cruelty and violations that happen. Okay. And I just can't bring myself to say it right now for some reason. I don't know why. But if you just put the word humane in front of it, okay, and it is the equivalent of that humane slaughter, humane animal holocaust, okay, that this is brainwashing, this is humane washing, this is propaganda. That's what it is. Let's take, for example, uh, some, <clears throat> some farmer far away, maybe far away in time, in the past, grows an animal and uh, the animal has uh, a wonderful life, grazing. It's just hilarious hearing him say this. You know, the neighbor's children had a wonderful life. So I'm going to shoot them humanely in the skull and chuck them in the oven like Hansel and Gretel and enjoying itself and is that the, the sorry am i am i uh, still going here but uh anyways like is hansel and gretel the uh thing where they get eaten by the uh the witch or whatever i don't know is that the right is that the right nursery rhyme or whatever it is anyway let's keep going and when the time kind comes he kills it, the animal in in a, in a in a you know in a nice way is the nicest <laughs> In a nice way. This guy is digging his own hole. Look at Gary's face. Can we get a zoom in on Gary's face here? Where it's possible. Uh, no, no, no. This isn't it. We need um we need Gary to just he's holding his hands and he's looking at him. How come I how come I can't He kills it? How come I can't zoom in? But anyways, can you guys see my mouse here? Look how he's holding his hands. <laughs> Actually, you know what I'll do? I'll do this. So look how he, look how he's holding his hands there, just like, oh, you are digging your hole. You are just digging it. Keep digging. Dig it. Okay. The, the animal in in a, in a in a you know in a nice way is the nicest possible. <laughs> the way he just went. <laughs> The way he just went back like that was just too much. He's just like, <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, yes, murdering animals is nice, is it? Are you okay? Do you need clinical help? Shall we take you to the doctor to, you know, get yourself checked, dude? What do you mean nice killing? Are you crazy? And people call, you see, people call Gary the extremist, right? But this guy's saying killing can be nice. Wait a second, like... Gary's the extremist because he wants bad things to happen to bad people. Okay, you might disagree. That's fine. You might be a pacifist. That's fine. Not everyone is, but you might be. This guy thinks killing can be nice, right? But Gary's the one under the pump here. Gary's the extremist. This guy thinks killing is nice. Why is one the, like, the one who's trying to promote peace for animals and bad things happening to bad people, the extremist, and the person who's saying, someone who's having a happy life, basically, an animal who's having a happy life, you walk up and kill them nicely without justification. You know, he didn't mention a survival situation. He's not in one, obviously. He's a TV star. But, like, they're already living nicely, having amazing well-being and happiness, and he comes along and robs their life from them violently and he's saying that that is nice. But Gary's the extremist. Ha like, I just can't. I, I'm sorry. I can't. This is not Holocaust. This is the way of life. Okay, so if I go... This is not a Holocaust. This is a way of life. This guy, like, he's giving us too much... Con I don't know how Gary like, just sat there with a straight face. Now, like, when I'm in that type of situation, I, I can do it too, but... 
this isn't a holocaust, it's a way of life. Imagine that, hey? Like, what's happening to the animals isn't a holocaust, it's a way of life. I mean, the gas chambers, the branding, the tattooing, the cramming them into trucks and, you know, the mass murder and the torturing and the separating families and the raping dairy cows and taking their male calves and smashing them in the head with hammers and chopping body parts off of them and snipping their teeth out, you know, snipping their tails off, you know, just tormenting and terrorizing and murdering billions of animals. This isn't a holocaust. This is just a way of life. Insane. Go oh, and meet a woman at a bar. I buy her some drinks. I bring her some flowers. I take her back and put on some soft music, some Teddy Pendergrass, and we dance and we look in each other's eyes. And I slip her a date rape jug and rape her. Is that humane? Why not? She didn't feel a thing. Look at his face. He look at his face. Can we just get a close up? Oh, did you did you just come crashing down, dude? Mr. Humane, kill him nicely. Mr. Kill him nicely. I actually think, like, I'm not going to be too hard on him because he was actually, he was pretty good, this guy. And apparently I heard that he went vegan. So forgive me if you're watching this, my friend. I'm only reacting to the way you were back then. We, you could have a different opinion now. And you could have a different position now, a different ethical position now since you had this conversation with Gary. So don't um I hope you're not overly sensitive here. And um, you know, so because you are actually a real person, you don't just exist in Gary's video. But uh so yeah, just wanted to say that he probably might not hold these positions now. And I heard he possibly went vegan. So, anyways, um his face when Gary says can rape be humane if I slip them a date rape drug, drug and they don't feel it? Interesting. Can we get a play? See, because the act of rape Chris Hines. Evil, okay, the act of murder. Chris Hines, how's it going, brother? He's in there debating. Say hello to Chris Hines. Just want to say, Chris Hines, lovely guy. Helped me out so much throughout my activism. Chris, love you, mate. A date rape drug and raper. Is that humane? Why not? She didn't feel a thing. See, because the act of rape is evil. Okay, the act of murder is evil. You can't do it in a nice way. Okay, we have to stop thinking that there's a nice way. In fact, you know what the nice way to kill is? Not to kill. That's a nice way. That's a nice way. <laughs> do you know, like, like I said, when Gary was being made, too much logic. Oh, oh, too much logic. Oh, my God. Like, what are we going to do with this guy? This is God creating out, Gary. Too much logic when he was created. You know, this guy is just like, you know what a nice way to kill is? Not to kill. It's crazy, and it seems simple now as a vegan for, you know, nearly eight years. And I have seen – I've watched this interview probably about three dozen times in the last eight years. But, like – it's crazy how he had to logically bring him to the point to the point where he had to admit that killing isn't nice. You know what I mean? Even when killing is completely morally justified, like in self-defense, it can't be nice. How is it nice to rob someone's entire existence from them for eternity? Once you kill someone, they are gone for eternity. Ain't no coming back. That is the... Biggest injustice to rob someone's life from them for eternity and not let them live out their natural lifespan, you know. And he was trying to call it nice. And Gary had to logically lead him to the point where he was like, actually, not killing is nice. Is it working? Do you think, do you think that the world is progressing um, in the direction you want it to, pro to progress in a, in a, in a pace? He's... He just seems like a changed man already. Are you getting this feeling? Like, are you getting this feeling? Should we do a close-up of this part? That's efficient. Not quickly enough for the victims. But sadly, as you know, change is slow. It took 400 years to convince white people in America not to own blacks. Uh, I had not see why this is taking so long. We can't even treat each other kindly. You can see why we have a difficult time treating chickens. And You know, 
four hundred years in America, uh, white people were enslaving people of color. Four hundred years in a civilized country. What? That's insane, you know, and like that's four generations. It's four or five generations of slavery. Like slaves were being born into slavery, human beings born into servitude, you know, and Gary's like, and these are human beings. These are the same as us. These are human beings with a different shade of skin color to other human beings. Like, so like this human being's got a, a, a covering over them that's this color, and this human being has a covering over them that's this color. And you were like, well, I'm going to enslave that colored human being. Like, crazy, insane, just like, insane, um, like, immoral justifications for enslaving people because there's a different tone of skin on their body. Um, you know, and this is why Gary hasn't, you know, has always had little hope for people not to enslave non-human animals because if we couldn't even get that right for so many, and, and human beings are still being enslaved, by the way, um, children being, you know, it's horrible things going on all around the world, all around the world. So, but you can see why there's so little hope for the non-human animals because if it took four or five generations for humans to stop enslaving other human beings in a so-called civilized country like, you know, America, what hope do the pigs have? You know what I mean? So anyway, let's keep rolling. Pigs and cows and mice and insects with kindness. But as I bring this up, I want to let people know that the, the path to peace is through veganism. It is by, we, we, can, we can find peace on this planet by eradicating speciesism. Because this is the first form of hatred humans are taught. Racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, heterosexism, these are branches of hatred. The root is speciesism because that's the first form of hatred humans are taught. First of all, like, you know, most human beings should by now be anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-homophobia, you know, anti all these isms by now, like anti you should be respecting the rights of other human beings by now. You know what I mean? Like, if you aren't, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Like, if you aren't respecting other human beings because of their race, skin color, you know, nationality, uh, sex, uh, sexual persuasion, um, what gender they, they identify with by now, <laughs> you've got some catching up to do because, you know, I'm hopefully operating off the assumption and I know there are racists out there. I know there are bigots out there. But I'm, I'm operating off the assumption that most people, I, I hope, are just, you know, anti all of those other forms of discrimination and they've got a little bit to go with speciesism. But, you know, that I believe that is looking at the world through ro rose-coloured glasses because there's a big world out there and there are a lot of, unfortunately, bigoted people out there. But Gary's uh, philosophy is that all of these... Um, forms of discrimination if we are taught not to discriminate against uh other species as a child which is the first form of discrimination we're taught like to eat the pig and to love the dog then we would understand discrimination better we would understand that we don't you know discriminate against the the pig in a horrible way and the, the outcome of that discrimination is they get murdered so we can eat them if we if we are taught that from a young age and we, we wouldn't look at each other we wouldn't be be able to be taught racism uh, maybe we could Maybe we could, but we are less definitely less likely to be if we are taught that you know what matters is our in inherent value. What matters is the dog's inherent value. You know their consciousness, their sentience, that they suffer and feel pain, and they can experience well-being, and they're deserving of rights. And the same with the pig, and the same with all people, all human beings, and all conscious beings. So it's just a lot less likely for people to turn out to be, you know, white supremacist. You know, just or homophobic or whatever the you know some for other form of discrimination if they're taught to value conscious beings because of their inherent worth basically
That's wrong. When you're a kid growing up, you're taught, hey, be nice to the dog, be nice to the cat. But that cow, that chicken, yeah, he doesn't count. Just kill them, screw them. Uh, be nice to the horse. Uh, be upset when somebody poaches a rhino. Uh, be upset if somebody cuts the fins off of a shark. Hey, but that uh, turkey, hey, kill him. It's Thanksgiving, it's a holiday. So the kid is confused growing up. So when we get down to talking about discrimination and why it's wrong, where it comes from, it all stems from that somebody looks and acts differently than you. If you taught a child growing up that, hey, just because that chicken looks differently than you do, that chicken has every right to live. That spider has every right to live, just like you do. How is that child going to grow up and look at a different person who's a different size, shape, and color? How is that kid going to look at that person in hatred with violence, speciesism? By eradicating that, we can bring peace to this planet. We have to take a break uh, here. Short one. The other short one. And we all know in Gary's retirement speech that he actually uh, took that back, which is very sad. Um, should we just should we just try to get up Gary's retirement speech? Uh, because uh, Gary actually did take that back in his retirement speech. Um, <laughs> his retirement speech actually. I don't know if I want to read this retirement speech because there's a bit in there. I did uh, read it, but um, uh, so let me just get here. Uh, <laughs> man, he's pretty full on in this, actually. I, I will just read one part to you. And this part here of this... Um, Well, basically, this part here of his retirement letter mean, meant the most to me, and it actually um, it inspired me a lot, you know, back in, I believe he retired, um, when was it? 2017. Okay, so, yeah, I was like, I was pretty m well into my activism by then, but I was inspired by Gary a lot, and he says, uh, I actually cried when I read this part at the end here. Um, I did. I was tearing up and I, uh, yeah, I felt it in my soul when I read this part. It says, and a huge massive shout out to those who fight for animal liberation only and have always used my activism as a tool to further the cause because it is now your job to find people who are thirsting for knowledge, who aren't comfortably numb with all the cruelty and edify them. If everyone did their part and converted 10, 100, 1,000 or more, a vegan world would be in reach. Just speak for the animals like you would want to be spoken for if you were in their position and always follow your heart when it comes to activism. Stop thinking of ideas when you can put those ideas into action instead. And please stop having meetings and conferences because you will only end up discuss discussing those meetings at the next conference before scheduling another conference to debate and discuss the previous meetings before having another discussion. So basically he's saying stop talking about what you're going to do and just do it. <clears throat> conferences and conferences and conferences about conferences and conferences instead of action, 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 action. In my prime, I was a man of action who lived by the adage that if you wanted something done right, then you ha actually had to do it and do it yourself. You should live by that adage too. Am I pronouncing adage right? I don't know. Put all those tears, all that anger, and all that knowledge into action. You'd be amazed with the results. Unfortunately, you will discover that enlightenment is bittersweet. Seeing the truth, knowing the truth, and living the truth is wonderful. But realizing how evil our family, friends, and species are is maddening. Just keep opening the eyes of as many people as you can for as long as you can. So one day you too can say, tag, you're it, to a bunch of people you've influenced. This essay is called Tag, You're It. And essentially he's passing the baton on because he retired. Incredibly sad. Um, hard to see him go. And uh, spoke to my heart this part here. And I had, took it very personally. And I haven't, I wasn't, I didn't think I was going to stop, but I definitely the animals keep me motiv not motivated, committed, and dedicated. Motivation comes and goes. Some days you're not going to be motivated. You have to keep speaking for the animals anyway. 
Um, if you rely on motivation, it is a finite resource. It will not get you through um, the battles. You do it because you have, if you're like me, I've got an, an unquenchable uh, thirst. I've got a fire that co is constantly burning and it constantly motivates me through that. It's like it won't go away and it can never be, it can never be quenched. It's like I have to keep going no matter what. And uh, that's what commitment is and dedication. And um, I think Gary just kept going. You know, I'm early days. I'm early days. I've been vegan nearly eight years. I've been, uh, you know, active for since around, I would say, the start of 2016, end of 2015. So I've got a long ways to go. But um, don't plan on stopping soon. And I uh, just wanted to point to this last part of his essay here. He's giving activists advice, and Gary, you know, would rarely give activists advice. He would rarely, he would usually only talk to media eaters. But you know, he didn't really like doing activist workshops and things like that. He just wants people to take action, and um, yeah, a lot of people have taken action since Gary is a massive movement, and. Um, I just wish he would come back so that he knew that there would be support for him now. He's not the only major activist in the world who has a massive platform and, you know, it would just be like he back in those days there wasn't really anyone on the in the world saying what Gary said with the with the platform he had. Not in the way he's saying it, and that's for sure. Not with the platforms he had. And the people that he reached on social media, he went viral. He was like the first uh animal rights activist to go that viral. <laughs> Gary, it was Gary, you know, so, um, yeah, he had an incredible weight on his shoulders and he'd already been fighting for many years, about 18 to be exact, I think. And then he got on social media for the last couple of years and then he retired, so 20 years in. And uh, because he went hard, as hard as he could. So, yeah. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed tuning into the... Gary Orofsky reaction live stream with Joey Carbstrong and um, that's me. <laughs> so you got any questions for me before we leave? Um, we can have a look here. Um, what do we got? What do we got here? Any questions? No. We can do a couple. We can run through a couple. It's been two hours and 20 minutes. We can do the next 10 minutes of questions if you like. Um, no. Okay. Maybe I'll give it – should I give it a little second? So someone's saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yoko. Yoko, I can't pronounce your name. I'm super sorry about that. Try my best. Thanks for joining us, guys. I appreciate it. Um, a little bit of a Gary Yurofsky, uh reminder. Uh, Gary stopped. That Gary burned out. He's very open about what happened, but I think it must have been pretty serious for him to stop because he very he felt what the animals are going through deeply, and he made a rash. He's a rational person. He made a rational decision. So I don't think it would have just been on a whim. I think it would have been getting to that point where he. Um, you know, wasn't left with much of a choice. And uh, if you know anything about the way he is, uh, it would have been very serious for him to to stop. You know what I mean? He wouldn't just have given up um, without it being the end of his tether. <clears throat> and uh, I think that Gary, two decades fighting that hard, being imprisoned and also the amount of work that he did, you know, it makes sense. So, thanks guys for sending your donations through. The 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 we'll put that the, the donations um, into the operations here at Joey Carpstrong, so we can get you know do various um, things. So if you guys wanted to support our work here, like we are picking up the steam, and we've got multiple projects on the go at the moment. Um, 
so any help is I'm extremely grateful for and you know we can do more with more money and that's just the way it is we without funding we we can't you know we can I could I mean I've done this with just my computer and myself but it's uh we can get a lot more done with funding that's for sure so guys if you want to help please do uh greatly appreciated and uh we can start smashing it we're gonna make a big impact and um it's just you know i know this is so cliche and everyone says it that is cliche and a bit cringy but uh i'm gonna say it now because i'm not cliche and cringy because i actually mean it <laughs> is that uh it's just the beginning and uh got a lot to come and i've been saying that for ages <laughs> i think i say that once every few weeks so yeah for the last few years so thanks guys all right i ended on a cliche gary's a legend he's courage personified definitely all right, my friends, thank you for tuning in to the Gary Yurovsky live stream with Joey. Peace out. I'll speak to you all soon.